Aloha and welcome to the Hawaii Smooth Jazz Connection. I am your host, Gwendolyn Harris. Today, we will be taking a look at at an American jazz pianist and composer, Thelonious Monk, who had a unique improvisation and style and made, made numerous contributions to the standard jazz repertoire. My guest today, Dr. Catherine Waddell Takara and Mr. James Harbour, each are well known throughout Hawaii and will be helping me to discuss the music of Thelonious Monk. Let me tell you a little about my guest. Dr. Takara earned her PhD in political science and an MA and BA in French. She is a recognized scholar, celebrated intellectual, and performance artist, and has given poetry readings in Bordeaux, France, Abidjan Cote, Devor Nyamin, Niger, and around the United States. She is the owner and publisher of Pacific Raven Press, LLC, which has published 18 titles. Mr. James Harbour has been working in the radio and television industry for over 30 years, starting in Chicago, then, then California, and ending up here in Oahu for over three decades working at radio and television stations. He is the producer of his own podcast, Jazz Intersection. Let's welcome Dr. Takara and Mr. Harbour to the show. Welcome. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you for having it's us. A pleasure. I am so glad to have you guys here. Because I'm, I'm out of my norm today. I want you to know. Right. Um, but this is going to be a learning experience for me. And in learning about Mr. Thelonious Monk, he was something else. Something else. He was something else. Yes, Pioneer. He was. Yes, he was. Can you guys tell me who is this Thelonious Monk? Well, Thelonious was one of the greatest jazz musicians of all time. He was in the, the category with um, um, John Coltrane, um, uh, Art, Blakely. You, Art Blakely and a bunch of them. But the, the main thing is he was a pioneer in uh, first creators of the modern jazz and bebop, mm -hmm. you know. And then on this interesting, interesting background with him, you know, he, he learned how to play when he was 11, I think. But he learned from his sister mm -hmm. looking over her shoulder as she played, you know. And then he um, went to Juilliard, mm -hmm. believe it or not. And he, he, that's where he got all his education, you know. And then he got out on, uh, he got on the loop he, and playing at the Apollo. So he's playing at the Apollo and he played, he won so much, they stopped him from coming there. <laughs> <laughs> you know? So, but he's an unusual type player because he still plays stride, yes. which is with that left hand, you know. And uh, he's an extraordinary person with uh, all kind of, they call him eccentric, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. because he was, you know, he, he liked to dance when he played. You know, they'd be playing and he'd be dancing. I read that, yes. Yeah, and then I he, did he'd read come that. back and play catch up, you know. But uh, he was an extraordinary guy. And uh, I'd like to, Catherine, uh, give a little about what she thought about him. Uh, well, you know, he's from the South, and I'm from the South. He's from North Carolina. And his parents, uh, I think, were very uh, unique. His father was a musician. And um, he started playing music actually very young, about four or five. Right. By the time he was eight, he was playing uh, for public things. And by the time he was 12 or 13, he went on um, tour, I guess, with the church. And he played with a, like a revival church. And he played the organ and he played the piano. And then um, he went to be, uh, this fancy school in New York. Was it Bedford Stuyvesant? Stuy? Yeah, Bedford Stuyvesant. And mm -hmm. um, he quit and went on the road at a very early age. And that takes a lot of courage and yes. a lot of um, dedication, I guess you could say. And his parents apparently let him do it. <laughs> My mm. parents would never have let me do that. <laughs> I know. But he must have been with people that <clears throat> they trusted. Right. Yeah. Now, how did he get his name? Because I know you wanted to talk a little bit about how he got his name. That's a very unique name. Yes. His name actually is Thelonious sphere, like the stars, monk. And Thelonious, I looked it up, is a Latin derivative, and it means bold, it means lord. I think that was very mm -hmm. appropriate, mm -hmm. lord, because that's what he became in the piano uh, thing. But there are other, other meanings to uh, Thelonious. The Bohemian name refers to artistic <clears throat> or political person, mm -hmm. and, but with spiritual qualities. And then it also refers to an attitude, which is a, a lot of cool, 
which is distinctive and a bit badass. And, <laughs> and that describes him to the T. To the T. I, I read where something where his style was not really appreciated by some people. And the poet and jazz critic Philip Larkin dismissed him as the elephant on the keyboard. Mm -hmm. Now, I watched him. You know, I was going through YouTube and, mm -hmm. and, and seeing all this. I don't know where this guy got this from because the, he, just what you said through his name, he was bad. He was mm -hmm. bad. He was bad. He was bad. And he also had a very unique style of dress. Did you want to talk about that? Well, he, he, he liked pork pie hats. And he had all different kind of styles of hats, you know, flat, curved, wax, I mean, all, all kinds. Uh, but he liked them small, as you can see on the monitor. He liked small pork pie. Mm -hmm. um, he liked to wear glasses. Sometimes he put you on. He didn't really wear glasses, you know. But uh, at one time, he was at a recording session, and he had on these glasses. And uh, the uh, producer asked him, oh, hey, where did you get those glasses? He said, they're invisible. <laughs> you know, these are invisible glasses, you know. So that's the type of guy he was, you know. But he he was very he was very eccentric. It, as we go on along, uh, knowing about his history, he um uh he, he ended up having he would become both bipolar, mm. you know. And uh, but he was he was extraordinary. He got his whole work playing the piano and getting gigs was about his family, mm -hmm. you know, taking care of. Economics, that was the whole thing. You know? Right. That's yeah. what I admired so much yeah. about him. He was yeah. a family man. Yes. yes. He Definitely. had his two yes. children, his boy and his daughter, and he was home when he wasn't playing music. Mm -hmm. But one thing about his style that was curious to me was, whereas most people play the piano with the, with the lifted, you know, he would just flat-hand it, uh -huh. bam, bam, bam. And then he would um, not only favor the right or the left, but he would be able to balance both, whereas mm -hmm. a lot of the jazz musicians, they would favor one side or the right. other. Right. And then he would do a lot of scales, mm -hmm. and he would do a lot of pauses, and that's what threw people off, was his pauses and um, his silent times. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They, they just didn't know what to do with that. What to expect. Yeah. yeah. They didn't know what to expect and even it. now, even now, uh, a lot of people, when they hear him, they might be a little off, you know, and mm -hmm. what, is, what, is, what is he doing, you know? Mm -hmm. Give an example. I had a radio show here years ago, and I had this young man doing, uh, doing the board for me. Mm -hmm. And he had never been involved in jazz, but he would, you know, he never said anything to me about it. But then one day when I played Monk, after the record went off, he came out of the street and said, who was that? I said, Thelonious Monk. He said, that was great. <laughs> and it was just, you know, it's kind of like, how did he know? You know, but he gives, he plays with such feeling, you know, mm -hmm. and and the style that he plays with is is just no nobody else plays like him. Right. Let's just put it like that. Nobody. He has his own. He, he he's in the in the in the game where he says, if uh, you want to do what you want to do, do what you want to do. Mm -hmm. Be what be like you want to be, and that's what that's the style he was playing. Now he was one of five jazz musicians that were on the cover of Time magazine. That's back in the day, too, That was back yeah? in the day. Mm -hmm. One of five. And the other ones that were on the magazine were Louis Armstrong, Dave Brobeck, Duke Ellington, and Wynton Marcellus. Right, right. That's right. And he was very close and admirable with Duke Ellington. And they did a lot of um, collaborations together. And that was great. In addition to the more bebop kind of people, mm -hmm. Ellington was so classy. And I think that um, it was said that he was the second most productive composer. Mm -hmm. we, yes. think of, we think of him as just playing the piano, but when mm. it comes to composing, mm -hmm. that's its own special thing. Right, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. right. Now, I know, James, you and I had a conversation maybe a couple of days ago. Mm. Uh, we were talking about the, the smooth jazz and, right, and all that. Right, what right. was that conversation that we had? You said, this is where it came from. Right. Is that what you told yes, me? Yes. Go all, ahead and explain it. Uh, smooth jazz. I'm going to put smooth jazz. It started out being a marketable thing. Mm -hmm. You know, um, what's his name? Uh, Kenny G. Kenny G. Kenny G. Uh -huh. You know, but it. then it was, it was based on vocals, though. Mm -hmm. You name the vocalist, uh, what's her name? Um, you name them. That's how they, they started. Mm -hmm. You know, they started with the smooth jazz. And then the instruments came in. And, but all, all the music, all the jazz, so-called jazz music, came from blues. 
It all, it, all of them have played blues. Mm -hmm. John Coltrane, all, that's how they started, you know. Matter of fact, John Coltrane used to play in the bar and stand up on the, on the bar blowing mm -hmm. his horn, you know, playing the blues. But, you know, they, they, they needed work, right? <laughs> so, right. hey, that's where, you, that's where you go. And that's how I started. I started listening to blues. I'm from Chicago. So I would go down to the corner, mm -hmm. and almost every other corner was a blues bar. Wow. And you could hear the blues all night long. Well, they you say that I mean. Chicago is the, is the city for the blues and yeah, the jazz Yeah, you can hear music. blues all night long. But that's where it all started. It started uh, a ragtime and then the blues. Yeah, well, gospel in between. You, mm -hmm. you understand what I'm saying? You mm -hmm. know, but that, that's where it all came from. And then um, uh, mostly they were playing a progressive, progressive jazz. And then uh, that's when uh, Coltrane and uh, uh, what's the other? Miles. No. Um, well, Miles was in that. He was in that loop. But um, uh, I'm lost. Today. But anyway, they, they are the ones that started bebop with Dizzy mm -hmm. Gillespie and all of them. So that changed the, the style. That changed the style, you know, where swing was in. Big time, mm -hmm. you know. You gotta get out there dancing and cap um, Callaway, yeah, and all of yeah. Those, uh -huh. That was in big time, and then they changed the the mode of the modality of the music, mm -hmm. which made it uh, more expressive, you know. Yes, and, and then yeah. another thing about Monk was he uh, for his blues songs, of which he did, he would do a lot in B minor. He played a lot in mm -hmm. B, B minor, mm -hmm. and people would say, "Well, why well, get out of that?" or that. But that was, and so a lot of his actual um, songs mm -hmm. have blues written in the title. Right. Yeah. So that was interesting also. Wow. Most, most modern uh, jazz players, and I guess you can say a lot of uh, smooth jazz players now too, if some of them have identifiable tones. Yes. You know. And that's with Monk. When yes. you hear Monk, you know that's Monk. You know Monk. that's him. You know, yeah, exactly. when you hear John Coltrane, you know, you know that's, that's him. him. Exactly. You know I mean? So exactly. that type of thing. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Well, we're going to go on a quick break, but don't go anywhere. We'll be right back. Aloha. I'm Stan Osterman, a host here on Think Tech Hawaii, a digital media company serving the people of Hawaii. We provide a video platform for citizen journalists to raise public awareness here on the island. We are a Hawaii nonprofit that depends on the generosity of its supporters to keep on going. We'd be grateful if you go to thinktechhawaii.com and make a donation to support us now. Mahalo. Aloha, this is Scott Perry, and I'm the host of Let's Talk Hawaii at Think Tech Hawaii. In this show, we're going to be speaking in English and Japanese, and I'm going to use my 30 years of experience to help many Japanese viewers improve their English skills, as well as learning many interesting things about Hawaii. You can catch my show every other Tuesday, 3 p.m. Hawaii time. See you then. Aloha, and welcome back to the Hawaii Smooth Jazz Connection. Today we are talking about the Thelonious Monk, the man and the music. And I have here today with me Dr. T Dr. Catherine T Waddell Takara and Mr. James Harbour. So welcome back. Thank you. This, Thank this you. is so interesting for me. Um, yeah. Now, we were talking about the life earlier, the first part. We were talking about the life of Thelonious Monk. Mm -hmm. You guys are going to be having an upcoming event, and we're going to talk about that in a few minutes. But I want... Catherine, to talk about this Afrofuturism. What is that? Well, you know, it came to me uh, through a graduate student of mine who's now a professor, and it was fairly recently, and he said, you are an Afrofuturist. And I said, what? And he said, yes, but what I think it really means is you're rooted in tradition, but you have this vision mm -hmm. that transcends the present. And it includes, I think, all parts of oneself. It is emotional. It is intellectual. It involves the moving. And it's spiritual, all mm -hmm. of those things. And usually with Afrofuturism, it's something that someone starts in the past. No one is understanding it at all. Mm -hmm. And then however many years later, 
it suddenly becomes in vogue. It suddenly becomes understood. Then everyone is doing it. But meanwhile, the visionary right. was the one that had it. Um, I wrote that it was creatively centered and it was community oriented in a way in that the vision includes not only the self and the parts of the self, but also expanding to the community. And with real futurism, it's not only our personal ethnic or racial community, but it goes to the national community and the international community. And as we know, Monk traveled in Japan and Europe and extensively. Yes. And he had, a, he had a, um, as many artists who usually don't have a lot of money, he had a, a what do you call it, a patron. Mm -hmm. And she was a baroness. And she stuck with him through thick and thin. And she was good friends with his wife, so it worked. Mm -hmm. Even until his dying time, mm -hmm. she was there. I forget, her name is hard to pronounce. But Nellie, Nellie. Nellie, mm -hmm. that was the wife's name. His wife's name. Oh, you're talking about the patron. Um, the, the baroness, patron. Yeah, yeah, the yeah, patron. Yeah, yeah. So um, it was just interesting that he had a European type patron, mm -hmm. which again, Langston Hughes, had, you know, all of the, um, <coughs> at that time in particular, but that she saw his value. Mm -hmm. And she went and said, hey, you're not, because he lost his uh, license, remember, mm -hmm. his cabaret license. And um, she went to all these people and she said, he's a genius. You'd better <coughs> have him. You'd better have him. And she was, of course, persuasive, mm -hmm. being a, a, a Caucasian woman. Right. So, <coughs> yeah, uh, visionary ideas and expressions. And it's internal and external. I think Afrofuturism includes the heart and the soul, as well as, as I said, reaching out beyond oneself to nurture that. And it's, it's got a lot of vibrancy, a lot of difference, a lot of um, inspiration in its difference. <coughs> mm -hmm. And um, the last thing I want to say about it is it's dynamic, and it also has a psychological dimension when it comes to Monk, because he was deep. He was mathematical. He was psychological. He was all of these things. He understood time. it. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah, ahead of his time. Afrofuturism. Well, tell us about this upcoming event. James. Um, <coughs> well, the event, um, jazz and Afrofuturism, <laughs> the music of Thelonious Monk and, and, and uh, film and live entertainment, um, how it all started was. Um, Catherine and I, I've been knowing Catherine a long time. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, how I met Catherine was I came here uh, in 87. And, you know, as a black person here, <laughs> you, uh, it, you do like you do anywhere else. You go looking for black people, you know. So uh, I asked who was who was who. And they told me about <laughs> Catherine. I went up to the school at the University uh, of Hawaii and met her. So we've been friends ever since. So I have this film called In My Mind, featuring Jason Moran and uh, his uh, band called The Bandwagon. And it was sent to me through a, uh, a lady who is the producer in, um, from, um, I forget where it's from now, but anyway, she sent me, the, she wanted to know if I could show it here. Mm -hmm. And I said, okay, but I had it a long time. Uh, and it's never been shown here in Hawaii, never. You can pick up a little, a little tidbits yeah. on the YouTube, but it's never been shown here, mm -hmm. you know. So, I told Catherine, I said, Catherine, I got this film. I want to show this film. And, oh, okay, so why don't we do this? <laughs> you know, and, and we got four talented people here. We got the poet, we got this beautiful dancer. And, um, Sequoia. Right. And, and then we have this, um, this, this horn player who is outstanding. You know, Jason plays Jason, everywhere, yes. right? Jason, And yes. then uh, Iron Arnita, he's, he's, he's born and raised here. Mm -hmm. And he's, he had, both of them have CDs. Aaron Arnita, plays nothing but his music. He writes all his music. Hmm. And he has two CDs, three CDs out. But uh, he's outstanding piano player, and once you hear him, you'll see what I mean. And he'll, nice. he can, he can you, you'll hear Monk in him, you know. Really? Right, right. So, so I know we Catherine put this will together be doing some and, stuff, you know, too. Yeah. Catherine will be doing some poetry. poetry. Right, uh -huh. right. And Sequoia will dance. And you're going to be the MC. I'll do my best. <laughs> <laughs> and I know Jason is going to play, and I'm just looking forward to to that event. I know you've been talking about it for a long time. Mm -hmm. And I'm just looking forward to that event. Now, I know, Catherine, that 
you have a little poem for us. I do. Um, it's called Moon Jazz, the one I'm going to share. Mm -hmm. And um, it's, it goes, is there such a thing as a girl of little consequence? Is it of little consequence? That green love walked into the winter, announcing like a poet, this song is for you, sweet and lovely. Dancing on the ceiling like the riffs of a music man. The girl came woman, in his arms full of moon glow and metaphor. Jamming music of Monk, Coltrane, Mingus, and more. Too late. Too late, she told every star when feelings reappeared from the shadows of a remembered tune. Maturity's morning effaced the star dreams. Joy paused, caught in a net of time. Still, she remembered melancholy music, like whales spouting on the horizon of tomorrow's hope. Singing like whales, in spite of military corruption of ocean with sonar blasts, disoriented, some retreated, fled, or beached themselves. The young woman child rode the wind currents, listening for sounds of freedom, a melody of compassion under a Carolina moon. Jazz reappeared like improv, light as a blue breeze. Soft as a star-filled night, intense as a Pacific sunset, discordant as a little girl come woman, still of little consequence. Beautiful. That was beautiful. Now, for all of you <laughs> that do not know Dr. Takara, she writes all her poetry. She has books that are out. Why don't you go ahead and tell where they can find your, your stuff? Okay, well, it's best if you get it from Pacific Raven Press, mm -hmm. my company, um, because that way I get a little bit more. If it goes on Amazon, you can get it on Amazon, but Amazon takes about 60%. Mm -hmm. And so I always encourage people to come to P.O. Box 678, Ka'a'ava, Pacific Raven Press, and I will mail it out the day that I get your order. I have about eight books of poetry, and they vary in price. So the best way to know what you're getting is to send me an email mm -hmm. or go on Facebook or something, and I can respond. And they range anything. My newest one coming up is uh, On the Volcano, mm -hmm. so it's eco-poetry. But it, range, it uh, ranges from Alabama poetry to uh, Zimbabwe, Africa, mm -hmm. to oh. China, places that, where I've mm -hmm. traveled. And... Um, I love playing with words, and I'm quite the nature <laughs> fanatic, yes, if you is. will. So, yeah. Yes, she is. Okay. Okay. And, um, James, where can they listen to you? For those of you that don't know, James has his own podcast. podcast so go right, ahead and, right. and tell about that. Yes, I've been doing my podcast for mm, 14 years. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's called thejazzintersection.org. And I started in, well, 14 years, you know, but... I started from, I was on Kumu for two and a half years uh, independently. I ran out of money, so I decided, you know, what am I going to do now? So I was reading um, a Fortune magazine, and it, it was in 2003, and that's when it talked about podcasting. Mm -hmm. And I said, oh, I mean, I can do this, stay at home, mm -hmm. and it go all over the world. Mm -hmm. So that's what I did. I love every minute of it. I love every minute of it. So I do interviews. I do you know, you name mm -hmm. it. But um, mm -hmm. I, I've been I've been loving jazz all my life, mm -hmm. you know, and um, you guys should tune in sometime. Check me out <laughs> at the jazz in the section dot org. OK, right. tune in and you can see both of these people at their event, which is the go ahead. What's the date of it? The June 29th, June 29th, June 29th, June 29th. <laughs> so come on out to that event i will be there we'll see these two lovely people there here's some music and there's going to be food so it's going to be a lot of fun the food is complimentary wow you heard that food is complimentary complimentary, yes, complimentary. Yes. complimentary. Yes. so just come on out and food have and some beverages, fun yeah. and mm -hmm. you want to listen to some good jazz mm -hmm. listen to some poetry see some dancing just come on out i'm meet looking forward to it meet, and meet, meet good meet people, people meet good people, people. that's what the, that's what it's all about you know 
uh, not only we're we spreading music, right. but we want to spread some love. You Correct. know what I mean? Get everybody Correct. together, even if you don't know the person. You know, we want that's everybody. Hey, yeah, that's, that's right. How you Come meet on, people. and understand that we're we're there to try to enlighten. Correct. You know? Nice. Well, I will definitely be there, right and I hope to see you guys there. This ends our show today for the Hawaii Smooth Jazz Connection. I want to thank both of you, Dr. Catherine Waddell Takara and Mr. James Harbour, for being thank here you. on this show. Thank and you. I hope to have you back again soon. Thank you. Appreciate that. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. it's very wonderful. <laughs> to all my viewers, I hope to see you at this event next week. But until then, aloha and God bless.